Hello and welcome to Multifamily Investing Made Simple, the podcast that's all about taking the complexity out of real estate so that you can start taking action today. I am your host, Anthony Vecino of Invictus Capital, joined as always by Dan. I'm going to have a baby tomorrow morning at 7.30 a.m. Kruger. Or 7.30 p.m. Oh, was it p.m.? Three Did I get that wrong? Uh, it's any time in the next 24 hours, I think. It's pretty much fair game. Our, our listeners can't know this, but this baby has is over a week late now. She is tardy. As of tomorrow, she's a week late. Mm -hmm. So she's comfortable. <laughs> yeah, she's cozy in there. So that's exciting for you. But for us today, we have also got a really exciting conversation lined up for you guys with uh, Kim Lisa Taylor. This is going to be a really fantastic conversation. I'm looking forward to it because I've been diving into her book, been listening to her on these other podcasts. I got a bunch of questions that I want to um, just kind of fire at her. She's uh, just a bastion of knowledge. So we're going to bring her out, but first, let me read through the, the bio here. It is Kim Lisa Taylor is a nationally recognized corporate securities attorney, speaker, and the author of the number one Amazon best-selling book, How to Legally Raise Private Money. Now, if you're, at, if you're on YouTube right now, you can see me holding it up. Like, I got it. It's a good book. You should check it out. She is the founder of Syndications Attorneys, PLLC, and InvestorMarketingMaterials.com, whose purpose is to provide quality legal advice, plain English offering documents, and professionally designed marketing materials for clients nationwide. So without further ado, let's bring her on out here. Kim, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. So you're, you're out in uh, Idaho right now. We're from Minnesota. Is it super, super cold. That's the question on everybody's uh, mind. Yeah, mid thirties. All right. That's survivable. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan. So I grew up in I'm spending my summers in Idaho up in the mountains. And so I got a, I got a soft spot for it. And I imagine that you do too, seeing as how you're, you're living up there, but tell us um, a little bit about what got you into the field that you're in now, which is specifically real estate syndications and law. Like what was the path that led you here? So um, I actually had a previous career as a professional geologist. Uh, I still hold a professional Ooh. geologist designation in California. And I was working in the environmental consulting field. And I looked into my future and said, hmm, I don't think I want to keep standing outside behind drill rigs with uh, steel toe boots and hard hats in later life. I'd like to do something different. <laughs> and so I decided to go to law school. And uh, practiced environmental law for a while, but uh, really had a love for real estate. I'd been a real estate agent for a while and just really was uh, interested in that. And um, started uh, working for uh, an environmental law firm and then also was working for a real estate uh, litigation firm, uh, practicing homeowner association law. Figured out quickly that I don't have the mindset for litigation. But while I was going to law school, I always thought that I was going to run my own business at some point and that. Uh, I was going to use my law degree to further my own business. I, I had no idea it was going to be a law firm, but uh, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so I, I eventually met somebody who was doing syndications and uh, Gene Trowbridge, maybe some of you know of him. Mm -hmm. And I worked with him. Uh, we had a really great partnership for eight years. And um, then I decided that it was time to go off on my own, wanted to move to Florida and he was in California. So I decided to, to make the break and, and set up my own shop in Florida. And uh, that's what I've been doing ever since. So the other thing that led me to that though, was that I actually, even kind of within all of that, um, met my husband who was a real estate investor and we started going to real estate uh, education seminars. And we started out, we were in Southern California at the time and we started out going to a learning annex and uh, saw somebody speaking there, Dave Lindahl. And, uh, you know, we thought, oh, well, we can do this. Uh, we have experience with real estate. And I had some experience with multifamily. He had experience with single family. So we bought the home study course and we did absolutely nothing with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> about, you know, a year and a half later, we started getting on some of the calls. And, and uh, you know, then we decided to go to an event, a live event, and we'll go to one of the boot camps. And we just learned so much there. Um, decided that this was really cool. We wanted to try syndication for ourselves. We signed up for his coaching program, um, started uh, participating in that and going to his other events. And that was kind of what led to my meeting. Gene Trowbridge was, uh, was that. And uh, really just started, so kind of working it from two fronts. We actually syndicated a property, um, my husband and I and some friends, and we owned it for nine years. It was in Columbus, Ohio. 
and uh, and we just sold that last year. Nice. So, did you was it notice? a successful exit? Uh, yeah, it was, but it was a painful nice. hold. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, if, the we, first we one bought 2010. Are, right? mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask so, when you were going through that process for the first time, did you notice um, kind of a gap in the industry in, in lawyers that specialize specifically in real estate syndications or because I'm, I'm curious like why you decide to go that direction with it. If you uh, noticed that there was kind of a, a niche that needed to be filled there. Because you guys have. Well, it was more that it was just interesting because I really liked the idea of helping put deals together mm -hmm. and helping people to figure out. Because, you know, I real, realized that my clients had the same questions that I had when I first went to those events. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, so I know how to put all these deals together. How am I going to figure out how to get the money? And, you know, I have no idea at that point how to put together a partnership, how to split money with investors, you know, what I could earn and how to do it all legally and what were the you know, ramifications of all of that. So once I kind of dove in and started learning that from the legal side, um, then it, it became kind of a passion to go out and teach other people what I had learned and what had helped me. So if I have the timeline correct, you did your first syndication yourself in 2010 and you kind of started, you know, creating this uh, niche for yourself in the syndication attorney space, probably predating 2010 is my guess. 2008. Okay. So then you've, you've, you've seen a really long timeline, timeline of the industry and an interesting transition period around 2012 with the Jobs Act and what's changed from before that to after that, has there been a big change? Because it seems like, you know, in the last couple of years, everybody's talking about syndications. It's a really popular topic now, but, you know, go rewind past five, six years ago, not, not on a lot of people's radar yet. Yeah, well, so the original uh, exemptions that everyone was following are a little bit onerous and um, hard to manage. So um, the, uh, there's federal rules that allow you to raise money from private investors without having to you know, go public with your offering and get pre-approval before you start asking people to invest with you. So there's securities exemptions that, that prevent you from having to do all that, but each one has a very specific set of rules. And there's both rules at the federal level and then there's also some state level rules, uh, particularly if you're doing an offering all in one state. But most people aren't. Most people are bringing in investors from multiple states or buying properties in states where they don't live. When you start crossing state lines, then it makes sense to start looking at the federal rules. And the original federal rule for raising private money um, was Regulation D Rule 506. And that rule allowed you to raise an unlimited amount of money from an unlimited number of accredited investors and up to 35 non-accredited but sophisticated investors, but you couldn't find them through any means of general advertising or solicitation. And to be able to prove that, you had to show that you had a pre-existing substantive relationship with an investor before you started telling them about your investment opportunities. And that rule was a little bit difficult for people to deal with because not everybody had a big network. You know, And the original way that this rule even came about is th these were the country club deals. Mm -hmm. You know, you had some guys that had some buddies that had some money and, you know, one guy says, hey, I'm going to buy this apartment complex. And the other guys are like, hey, can, can I get in? And, you know, so that's how it kind of came out. They were these hush hush word of mouth deals. And so it became a little difficult in the age of the Internet and people becoming a little bit more global and you know, more uh, travel savvy and, you know, starting to look more not just doing local deals. Um, it became a little more difficult for people to follow those rules. So hence came the JOBS Act. And the JOBS Act was really aimed at trying to modernize Rule 506 so that there could be a, a, a way to advertise for investors um, still falling under the private offering exemption, which before had been only restricted to public offerings. So, so I think that, you know, there, there's been some changes. In fact, there's been some changes even in the last year that have been pretty significant. So uh, we can talk about those a little bit later. Yeah, yeah real quickly, before we move on there, because we, we've thrown out a couple of terms and I want to make sure that we don't lose any of our listeners who are maybe not familiar like, with the idea of what's an accredited investor or what's a sophisticated investor. 
Um, I think if you polled 90% of people, they probably wouldn't be able to give you the answer to either of those. Maybe let's just real quickly define those terms for, for the people at home. What's an accredited investor? So um, just think of this like the one, two, three rule, okay? You either have to have a million dollars net worth, excluding any equity in your primary residence, or you have to have uh, $200,000 a year income if you're single or 300,000 if you're married. So a million or the income requirements. Um, this, so that's for individuals or married couples. Uh, there are actually eight definitions of an accredited investor. And in fact, as of tomorrow, there are there's some new ones that, coming, right? That's where there's new ones that have yeah. just been approved and be, become effective tomorrow. Um, so now, you know, unmarried couples can, uh, st- cohabitants can start to uh, qualify. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's a few other, they, they, they try to loosen it up so that certain people with uh, licenses or professional affiliations could be able to uh, become accredited investors, but unfortunately they restricted it to only people with securities licenses, which is kind of a, a hollow expansion of the rule. Yeah, um, that doesn't really do much, help. it seems like. No, it doesn't help anybody. <laughs> I ask my clients all the time, how many of those people do you know? And they say no, and then <laughs> yeah. the other, none. And then the other side is that uh, even if those people do have those licenses, they're usually prohibited from investing in these kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but the SEC did reserve the right to further expand the definition by rule without having to go through the actual whole rulemaking um, comment, uh, you know, public comment uh, period. So it, it, maybe they're gonna try to expand that again later on when they've got a little less. Um, and, and what's the rationale behind that? Before we move on to the, the definition of sophisticated, I'm, I'm curious, what's the rationale for them to want to expand the definition of accredited? Do they want more people to qualify so that they can then push into the 506C regulation or what's really the the impetus there? In 2017, something happened. Uh, The market shifted and there was more money raised through private offerings than there was through public offerings. And so the SEC had to recognize that this was significant. And a lot of this came about because the lenders became reluctant to lend. And so people had to look for other ways to do business. So they started relying on these private rules. Um, So, you know, that's really what the, you know, I think what the gist is, is that the SEC is recognizing that there's a tremendous demand. And they're also recognizing that there needs to be an avenue for people to do this legally without as much restriction. Um, And that can actually help what they call retail investors. So retail investors, as far as the SEC concerned, are the ordinary people on the street. And so they, they realized that, you know, they were receiving a lot of complaints that these people are being left out. And, you know, why should we be excluded? We're smart enough and savvy enough to be able to protect ourselves. Why shouldn't we be able to do this? And so they responded. And I think also it's worth noting, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, you know, this isn't just specific to real estate. This is just raising mm-hmm. capital in general. So this includes, um, you know, like, the, one of the hot new terms this year is a SPAC, uh, spe- special purpose acquisition company. And it's it's kind of like, you know, w- without going into the weeds on that, that's something that you, you, you'll see on Wall Street. It's got nothing to do with real estate syndication. But I think there's a lot of pressure from a lot of places to just free up more capital to be raised. So it's not just the real estate industry. So I'm sure there's a lot of pressure from Wall Street pushing to get these rules loosened up so they can keep... Uh, getting more capital is, is that, well, except that, it, that it's kind of anti wall street in a way, because these deals don't go through wall street and there's no opportunity for broker dealers to participate for them. When I say part. wall street, I mean, private equity, I guess. So not yeah. necessarily wall street, but just more institutional investors realizing that there's, you know, there's a big pool of capital out here that we can't touch right now and we need to change right. that. So it's right. I think when you kind of factor that component in it, it becomes clear why these things are changing. I think there's just a lot of pressure to loosen up because you know, mm-hmm. to your point, to Anthony's point, it's just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You're just cutting people out who want to get in and the, the operators want to do the deals too. So it kind of helps everybody, right? As long as they're good deals, I guess. Well, and it, and it was kind of an exclusive atmosphere where the private equity could participate, but the retail investors couldn't. And uh, yeah, that was perceived as unfair, especially when it was realized that there's like $1.3 trillion raised in private offerings every year. Mm-hmm. So I do want to get into the difference between the retail investor and the institutional investor and kind of have it, shine some light on that because I think it's really interesting. But first, let's go back to the sophisticated investor and what exactly that means. Because for 
to my understanding, that's a little bit vague, more vague than the accredited investor definition. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit more subjective. So can you kind of break us break that one down for us? Yeah, so um, a sophisticated investor is someone who by themselves or with the help of an investment advisor has the uh, you know, economic, financial, or business background that makes them capable of evaluating the merits and risks of an offering for themselves to determine if it's appropriate for their portfolio. So boiling that down into you know, plain English, it's got to be somebody who's got more than just a job and some savings. They have to have some savvy, either education, probably investing experience, um, you know, or, or other, maybe they've been through your training program, right? Mm -hmm. So you can help someone become sophisticated by training them on how syndications work and what the risks of investing are and, you know, how the whole entire process works. And once they understand it to the point they could do it themselves, then they can make their own decisions on whether or not it's appropriate. Now, are there some specific boxes that people need to be able to check to fall into that sophisticated bucket or is it basically? No, it's very subjective. Yeah. It is very subjective. So the way that we ask the question, both in our subscription agreements, some of our clients want to use pre-qualification questionnaires, is that you ask an investor, you know, here's the definition, please explain to me how you believe you meet that. And if somebody wants into your deal, that they will talk about it and they'll embellish why they believe that they're sophisticated enough. And that's really what you want is for them to explain it to you in their own words. If they can't do that, then perhaps they shouldn't be investing with you. Okay. So the investor is kind of self-declared uh, sophisticated. And then does that mean, is there any way that it, something bad could happen and it could turn out that this person doesn't fit the qualification of being sophisticated? Like, well, if the, you know... That's one of the reasons that we have them talk about it themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've got to look at that def what they say defines them as sophisticated and make sure that you believe it's sophisticated enough to be in your deal. You know, just because somebody has money doesn't mean you want them in your deal. And, uh, you know, you don't ever want to take anybody's last money and you want to make sure that they can afford to lose the money or, you know, to take that risk. So part of this is not just having somebody make a declaration that I'm sophisticated because, but the SEC actually wants you to go through a, what they call a determining suitability, right? They want you to determine whether investors are suitable to be in your deals before you start offering them investment opportunities. And uh, they've actually... Um, there was a case a few years ago called VC Citizen that uh, some people had submitted a request to the SEC to evaluate what they were doing. And they said, well, if we do everything just this way, would this be something that you would take action on or not? Okay. And so what the SEC does is they evaluate these situations and they say, well, no, if you did it just this way, then we would not take any action. And that's called a no action letter. And these no action letters, there's a series of no action letters about the, you know, define how these relationships are developed and what's required to have the relationship that defines the body of law that the SEC looks at when they're trying to determine if somebody's sophisticated or not. And so the latest thing they said in this no action letter for VC Citizen was that we want you to determine an investor's suitability to be in your deal. And that's, and once you've done that, and you determine that they are suitable, then that is the substantive relationship. That's the beginning of the substantive relationship that you need to have before you can start offering investment opportunities to that person. If you're gonna do Reg D Rule 506B offerings that allow you to bring in those non-accredited investors. Okay. So and what I heard there is I, if we have a process built into our quote unquote funnel, where at a certain point uh, when someone's coming into our, our pipeline, We've, we've got almost like um, screening renters, like we've got our criteria, like people need to have X, Y, and Z. And we kind of make these up like no more than X percent of your net worth is going into this deal. You've got to have X number of years experience and net worth of X. Like if we kind of set those parameters or those, um, those criteria and then have people kind of provide that information on the way in, is that us kind of saying, okay, they meet our criteria, 
of these, you know, three or five different things. And, and is it enough if they're self-selecting it or is there a yeah. third party verification that would be Well, so it depends there? which exemption. So 506B is the one that we described earlier that allowed you to mm -hmm. bring in sophisticated investors. Rule 506C is the part that came out of the Jobs Act because up until the Jobs Act came into fruition, Rule 506 was the rule. And then after mm -hmm. the Jobs Act, they split Rule 506 into 506B, which was the old rule, and 506C, which allows you to advertise, but the only people that can invest with you if you're going to advertise are verified accredited investors. Yes. So they actually have to go through a third party verification process. But they left the old rule intact and said that if you're going to use 506B, then you don't have to verify, but you do have to ask and the person can self certify. But part of this, going back to your comment, Dan. You don't, I mean, your criteria sounds like are a little more stringent than what the rule actually requires. Okay, so the rule just requires that the person is sophisticated or accredited and you've determined whether they're suitable to be in your deal. So part of the suitability is finding out in advance before you start making offers to them whether they're accredited or sophisticated and why. And also, you know, talking to them and things about, you know, how long would you be interested in having your funds invested, making sure that the duration of their proposed investment is the same as yours. Yeah. Um, you know, what kind of returns are you going to offer? Are those in line with what they were thinking? Um, you know, just they're going to be in a group with other people. Is that something that's of interest to them? Just trying to feel them out to make sure that this is something that they're even comfortable doing. Yeah. And, and having a record keeping system to demonstrate mm -hmm. that when you had that conversation and that it started, it predated any uh, making of offers. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's like, we already do all that needs to be done. It's just, we haven't made a point to actually write it down and say, you know, you know, we've got our like investor qualification form that people fill out and they self-select because we don't advertise because we want to be able to have friends and family who don't meet the uh, credit investor qualification. But my thought was just having another set of questions in there to kind of check some of these boxes and say, yeah, we checked this. Here's a record of it happening on this date. Okay, we've done that. Now we don't have to worry about it. Well, the one thing that the SEC has been pretty explicit about is that they don't think you can do this all by means of an electronic questionnaire, mm -hmm. that you actually have to have a conversation with somebody. So really, um, we have uh, something that we call an investor relations blueprint that we share with uh, clients of our firm that, uh, and, and I'd be happy to share it with your audience as well, um, that talks about like the steps you need to take to, defend, to create a defensible relationship. And, you know, so you meet somebody, think of this like dating, you meet somebody and that's not the time to ask them to get married, right? You meet them, you exchange contact information, then you follow up. What's the follow up? It's usually a phone call. So, or, or maybe, you know, go for coffee or something. What do you talk about during that conversation? You're still not asking them to marry you. You're still just getting mm -hmm. a feel for whether or not this person is somebody you want to further a relationship with mm -hmm. and, you know, getting to know whether you have common interests or, you know, asking them these questions we've been talking about and gathering that information. It's almost like you're interviewing them for a job because in a syndication, you know, as you know, if you're, if you're syndicating that the, there's more than just one job. You need loan guarantors. You need, you know, people who might front you some cash for a little bit to get a deal to the closing table. You know, you need people that know other people with money uh, and you need people with experience if you don't have it. So you're interviewing this person for all of those different jobs to figure out where in your organization they fit in, in with a passive investor being one of those potential roles. So yeah. if you treat it more like that and you're, you know, you're gathering information, gathering intel, and that's, and then you go back to your office and, or maybe you're even doing it on the phone and you're taking notes about what was discussed yeah. and what you learned. And you're keeping that in your database so that if you were ever called on by the SEC or a state regulator or opposing counsel in a litigation matter to try to defend how you had a substantive relationship with this person before you made offers, you can say, because I had a meeting with them on this date and these were the things we discussed and here's where we met. Yeah, that's super helpful. And I think that blueprint would be amazing for our, our listeners and yeah. for us too, I'd, I'd love it. But you kind of mentioned something there that uh, kind of leads into some other questions Anthony I had for you specifically you mentioned all those different roles and responsibilities that are available on the general partnership side and one of which uh, is the capital raising role and I've seen a lot of groups out there and a lot of individuals in particular who have made it a point to be that 
individual in various syndications. And from what I can tell, do almost nothing more, which, you know, leaves Anthony and I kind of scratching our heads like now, the way we understand it, you can't just be out there raising capital. That's basically the same thing as just selling securities. And if you're not a broker dealer, you can't be doing that. So um, if you could talk to us a little bit about that concept and, you know, just kind of, you know, let us know if anything's changed recently, because I think there's some stuff in the works uh, that's changing in that department. And then also, you know, what's the stuff that people need to worry about and what can people do to keep themselves safe if they're trying to bring on a capital raising partner? How do they do that the right way? Yeah, so um, right now, the way the rule stands is the same way it has for a very long time. And that is that the only people that can receive commissions for referring investors to deals are licensed securities broker dealers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if you don't have a securities license, you can't receive a commission. What's a commission? It's called, the, the SEC calls it transaction-based funding. So transaction-based or transaction-based compensation. Transaction-based compensation is what it's, it's related to the amount of money you raise. So there's some formula that's deciding that if I bring in $2 million, then this is how much I'm going to get. The only people that can get those commissions are licensed securities broker dealers. If you're not a licensed securities broker dealer, how could you participate? Well, the rule is that you become a member of the management team and everyone in management has the role of raising money but everybody in management gets compensated for their role other than raising money. So nobody's getting specifically compensated for raising money. And that goes for all of the principals, uh, employees, staff. So you can't be even pay bonuses to you know, employees or staff that might be going out and, and bringing in money to you because that too would be viewed as a commission. So you really have to structure your management team so that there are multiple roles within your management team. Again, we talked about the loan guarantor. We talked, uh, but there's people who find the deal, people who conduct the due diligence, people who are going to be overseeing the property managers, people that are going to be um, uh, communicating with investors, and somebody's going to be overseeing the accountant. So you know, there's many more roles than that, but those are just kind of a broad stroke. You know, you can start delegating those tasks out to the people within your management team. And if you do that and everybody takes on a role and does that role, then you're going to have a smooth working team and you're never going to have to defend that anybody got paid for bringing in investors because everybody brought investors or that was just part of their job. Yeah. So you want to make sure that there's no correlation between how many dollars someone brought in and what they're taking out of the deal. As long as there's not a correlation there and they're filling some other bucket other than capital raising, then you should be then you're probably going to be okay it would be very hard for somebody to say otherwise Mm -hmm. but uh you know and if 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 somebody doesn't want to do that well there are other options they can go create their own fund Mm -hmm. that invested in your deal as a single investor but then they're doing their own securities offering they have to comply with their own exemption rules yeah so how meaningful does the amount of work, let's say, a person coming into the GP has to do within a particular role for it to qualify? Like, because I'm sure the SEC is savvy enough to go, okay, yeah, it says that you've taken this role, but you you, you only did like an hour of work. Is that enough? Is that... Well, so the I always, you know, as an attorney, I put on my attorney hat and let's just imagine, you know, Perry Mason courtroom for a moment and you've got uh, somebody on the stand and they're being questioned about what did you really do? And if all they can say is, uh, I really didn't do anything or, oh, I don't know, I just brought in some investors, then you're probably not going to pass the test. You know, so they Head really the need to be able, to, they need to be able to say more. Mm-hmm. And, and okay. that's only going to be a factor of what they've actually done, yeah. you know, so make them participate in due diligence, make them hunt down contractors, make them, you I feel know, like the lowest hanging fruit is the loan better. guarantor. I mean, that's a signature and you're done and it's on, it's, you know, you can't really argue that you signed on the loan, you took the risk. So that's a pretty big role and it's really passive other than right, but the loan guarantor the isn't engaging in securities off, you know, offerings. So, right. Or, no, it would be loan guarantor. And I, I'm kind of, Speaking with that, that's that this one of the easiest buckets raiser. from like if you need one other bucket to check, that's another that's low hanging fruit in my book is just sign on the loan too, and then you're doing well, two if they're days. okay if, with taking if, on that risk. If the person that's raising the money actually has the capability of signing on one, which yeah. may or may not be the yeah. case. If the if they're broke or negative net worth, that doesn't really help. I mean, there's a whole lot <laughs> a whole of people lot. that have a lot of ambition. And, you know, I'm yeah. sure there's a whole lot of stockbrokers that aren't uh, <laughs> capable of signing. Very true. Very true. <laughs> 
But they so really kind of the investors. Kind of circling this back to what we were just talking about is you know, creating a substantive relationship with the investor, but then we're also maybe working with a capital raiser. Do we have to vet our capital raising partner, you know, who's also has uh, other roles within the GP that they actually have a substantive relationship with their investors? Or if that investor is coming in through them, is, is that something that other members of the GP are liable to as well? Well, so everybody in management is going to be held responsible for following the rules of the exemption. So at whatever any one person does is going to be imputed to the whole team. And, uh, you know, if, you ever, if you've ever heard of the term joint and several liability, that just means whoever has the money gets hit. It's <laughs> a good way to keep it simple. And that's a really important nuance, too, because I don't think it's something that uh, I've ever really heard anyone talk about. Is I've never heard anybody Making sure that. that those capital raising partners are actually doing their own due diligence on their investors. Well, so, so you're re ultimately responsible for making exactly. sure that due diligence was done. And, uh, you know, in our subscription agreements, we actually have a place where the investor has to say how they met the member of the management team mm -hmm. that uh, brought them into the deal. And uh, we actually had a situation one time where a client brought us a subscription agreement and the guy said, I met him through an unsolicited email blast. <laughs> oh no. I saw his Facebook ad. He's like, deal. well, you're not going to be able to invest in this deal. Thank Oops. you for playing. But you know, you almost have, when you see something like that, it's like for me, antennas go up and it's like, is this a regulator testing you? Yeah. You know? And you have to think about that too. Uh, you know, if you've ever had a call from somebody or, you know, maybe you get a call from somebody who says, um, oh my gosh, so-and-so told me about your deal. And I'm just, I've got this money. I really need to invest it right now. And, you know, you're trying to raise the last hundred K and it's real tempting to take that money. And uh, I always say that if you're doing real 506 B offerings, the answer should be, I'm sorry, I don't have anything I could offer you right now, but I would love to get to know you and see if there might be something we could do some business in the oh, future. So the and SEC is out there secret shopping people. You know, know there's not a lot of money. First of all, nobody's traveling right now, but everybody's sitting around at their desk and, you know, Googling and, you know, <laughs> yeah. emails and getting on people's email lists and things like that. And, uh, you know, why not? Why wouldn't they? Yeah, well, I mean, that's something to be aware of too. I mean, in the past, you know, you've seen kind of the full uh, life cycle of the syndication business as it relates to real estate. I feel like you've, you've seen it kind of evolve. And, you know, early on when there's not a ton of transactions, I'm sure it's probably easier to kind of be a little looser on some of these rules. But now that there's so much capital flowing into these types of deals, I would assume that there's probably going to be more eyes on these as well and more people checking to make sure that you're doing things correct. Maybe it's well, the opposite. I don't know. The, you know, it, so there's always the, uh, you know, the good deal exemption and, uh, you know, the under the radar exemption where you're not getting, uh, you know, you're not drawing attention of anybody because everybody's happy and no one's complaining. But, uh, you know, as soon as something goes wrong, that's when things start to, you know, people start crawling out of the woodwork, uh, yeah. attorneys start showing up, regulators start getting involved. And, uh, you know, the other thing is, uh, you know, don't, if you're if you're an issuer of securities, don't start living high on the hog, because that will definitely start attracting the attention of regulators. Yeah. So no no uh, photo shoots in front of airplanes with your Benz. You should probably stay away from that. Yeah, that's that. right. You know okay. that that really just starts to you know it it does a lot of things. First of all, it it makes everybody think Ponzi scheme and Bernie Madoff. <laughs> And, uh, you know, <laughs> Bernie took any your photos investors in front of are getting jet. worried and they're looking at it like, wait a minute, this guy didn't give me what he promised me and he just bought what, you know, so yeah, that's it's not really our right style thing. either way. <laughs> yeah, I think there's some notorious examples of that out in space at the moment. Not going to name we get into, Not going to get into it. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I found really interesting as I was reading through your, your book is it ties into this idea of solicitation through email. And what qualifies as solicitation? And I think as a community of like, there's newer investors coming in and wanting to get into syndicating, they're not very clear on what it means to actually solicit. And they think, oh, you know, it's, if the person opts into my newsletter, my email list, I can present them this thing. Is that true? Is that not true? Because, you know, I've, I like to make a point of joining as many other operators newsletters as possible because I want to see what they're doing. I want to keep my finger on the pulse of how they're structuring their deals. And, but I've never actually had any kind of vetting conversation with another operator. So is that considered solicitation or is that still okay because I've opted into that private channel? 
No, so we're back to the determining investor suitability. Until someone has had that conversation with you, they shouldn't be soliciting you. And until you've had that conversation with somebody else, you shouldn't be asking them to invest with you. Solicitation is the act of asking, okay? Asking somebody to do something in exchange for money. Um, so anytime you're sending something out to a group of people that you don't already know if they're accredited or not accredited, if they're sophisticated or what their investing goals are, then you're potentially violating those rules. And as you pointed out earlier, the SEC has already made it clear that, you know, um, email opt-ins or online surveys, that's not, that's not good enough. Just having a box that I check and say, Hey, I'm accredited. Good to go. That's, that's not good enough. Well, it's not good enough from a regulatory standpoint, but it's also not good enough from a practical standpoint because, you know, you, the three of us are having a conversation. We're getting a pretty good sense of who we are just by, you know, being face to face with each other, even though it's over a screen and having these conversations. But if we were trying to do this all electronically by email, this would be a whole different discussion. And it wouldn't have the same feel, it wouldn't have the same flavor. When you're talking to some investor, to an investor or potential investor on the phone, and even if you don't have the video connection, you're getting a sense of who they are mm -hmm. and whether you like them. And realize you're asking this person to be a business partner with you for the next five to seven years uh, in a, you know, a scenario where things could either go really, really well or things could go really poorly. And you want to make sure that that person is somebody that you want to be in that situation with. I think that's a really, really important point that we can maybe reemphasize again is that if you're an operator out there, if you're maybe new to syndication, you're like, this is what I want to do. You might be, you might have the sensation of, I am desperate to get the money and I'll just take it from wherever I can get it. But that is the wrong choice for you as well as for the investor on the other side. Like desperate, going after desperate money is never a good idea. So you want to make sure that it's a good fit for both sides. It's not just a matter of, will they give me their money? It's a matter of, hey, should I take their money? And that's, a, that's not always an easy question to answer. But you know, to your, your point, you spend the time on the phone, you spend the time getting to know them, and you might, you, you'll come to that realization pretty quickly of, okay, maybe I don't want to be in a deal with this person for five to seven years. You'll get a sense for you know, the types of questions that they ask, their comfort level, if they're going to be a pain in the butt to deal with or if they're the type of person who's going to be vindictive in the future, like maybe, maybe don't take their money. Well, and one of the questions you might want to ask someone is, have you ever been in a partnership before and how did it end? Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Well, well, well I've had some, I've had some end badly. I've had some end really great. <laughs> right. But, but, but the way they talk about what happened, okay. Yeah. is going to cue you into what, you know, what you could be in line for. And, yeah. you know, this is kind of a weird analogy, but uh, I remember reading this book long, long ago about like dating red flags. Right. And uh, they were, you know, just saying that ask somebody what happened with their ex. And mm -hmm. if they go into a rant about their ex, are you going to put yourself in line to be the next person they're ranting about? Yeah, it's the same thing but with job interviews. If people are, you know, it said if they're complaining about their previous employer, you know, just assume that that's going to be the you, know, you in the future, right? That's right. But, you know, same I thing. mean, just because a, a partnership doesn't work out doesn't mean it ends horrifically. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so it's like, yeah, you know, I had some partnerships. They didn't work out so well, you know, but hey, there's always the next one. That person might be okay, but it's like, okay, I ended up in litigation with my ex-partner for six years, um, you know, yeah. might be a little bit of a red flag. Yeah, this reminds me of something um, Naval Ravikant talks about, which is the idea of like not doing business with negative people or people who are vindictive or mean to other people because yeah they might have their enemies and they might trash talk them but it's not very it doesn't take much for that to transition and for now you to become the enemy like if you see somebody who quickly creates you know forms negative relationships with other people and writes them off and says that person's dead to me blah blah blah, blah. well you're just one hop skip away from also being on the receiving end yeah. of that that's right or if they're like mean to a waiter or something it's like oh yeah that's, that's a great one that kind of stuff's a big tell Awesome. Well, Kim, this has been a fantastic conversation. It was so good, in fact, that we blew right through the bad investing tip for the week, which is actually maybe a good idea because our, our listeners, that's their favorite part of the show. And so now they've stuck around to the very end. Um, sorry, guys at home. Uh, if you were only hoping to tune in for five minutes, you've been here for the full show. We so like Kim, what is, 
Yeah, yeah, we like to bury the lead. So Kim, what's your bad investing advice for this week? Uh, one investor is better than 20. And, and what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, chasing after what I call whale investors uh, can lead you to on the road to ruin. Um, mm. Especially if you're kind of new at syndicating, you know, most of these people, you know, whether private equity, whether they're family offices, they're not going to do business with you until you have a proven track record. And that means they want to see five or six deals start to finish. And if you don't have that yourself, then you should be teaming with people who do have that experience if you want to go after that kind of an investor. Um, but you'll stay, keep much more control of your deals if you deal with 50 or $100,000 investors. Um, you, you know, these, uh, these whale investors are notorious for just stringing you along because they're too polite to say no and then disappearing at the end, leaving you holding the bag. I've seen that happen many, many, many times over the course of my legal career. So I'm just going to caution you, don't spend any time finding those people at all. And don't wait for investors. If somebody tells you I can get the money next week, just say, well, that's great. Give me a call next week. We'll see if we still need it. In the meantime, we've got to keep raising money. No one's an investor until their funds are in your bank account. I love it. Both of those are new that we've never heard on this show before. So for the audience at home, regardless of which side of the fence you're on, if you're a passive investor looking to get involved in multifamily syndications, you want to fund a deal, you, you're excited about that opportunity, just recognize that until your money hits the bank, you're not in the deal. And we've you know, had investors miss out on opportunities in the past because they didn't get their money in fast enough. It's a first come first serve world. And so that's, that's a, it's a, nobody likes having to say no and be like, oh, you missed out. That's a bummer for everybody. So if that's something that you want to do, if you're planning on investing with a self-directed IRA, you're going to want to make sure that you get all your ducks in a row well ahead of schedule so that you're ready to go when the deal actually arrives. So I love both of those pieces of advice. Um, Kim, before we let you out of here, what is your book recommendation for the week? You know, I'm not going to say a real estate book, but there's a book that I read in the past that has kind of helped me stay a little bit balanced and it's called The Four Agreements. Uh, and mm. it's by a gentleman named Juan Miguel Ruiz. And uh, he talks about uh, Toltec wisdom. And uh, those four agreements have served me well throughout my career. I think they've helped me, you know, kind of take the high road in some of those situations where I could have badmouthed other people. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. And I've always been glad that, uh, that I kind of took that to heart. So uh, I would highly recommend that book. It's a super easy read. And uh, he actually has another book that I also love, uh, which is called The Mastery of Love. And that's a really good book about our relationships and kind of keeping things in perspective. Love it. Both of those are good. I haven't read the, the second one you mentioned there, but the four agreements is very good. And I highly recommend that as well. Yeah. Um, so good. D Dan, have you read that one? I haven't. I'm writing it down right now. Though. All right. I'm, well, it's in next week's book club then. All right. So Kim, where can people get a hold of you if they want to, to learn more about what you're doing, if they want to work with you? Um, you mentioned a couple of great resources at the beginning of the show. How can people get in touch of, with you to, to take advantage of those? So um, the best way to reach us is to visit our website at syndicationattorneys.com. And um, do check out our library when you're there. Uh, we have over 50 different articles. We record uh, free monthly teleseminars. We do our own webinars every single month. Uh, so if you want to get notified about those, sign up for uh, one of our um, programs or, or our, our newsletter. Um, we will also, um, so at syndicationattorneys.com, you can check out the library. There's also some other uh, kind of cool stuff there. Um, we have an agreement that we're putting together with an accounting firm and a, an investor management platform where you're going to get syndication docs plus those two things all at one bundled price for a year. And uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, but you can also get a free copy of my book if you want to read it digitally. You can get that while you're there. And there's an article that uh, is, goes right to the heart of what we've been discussing during this call. It's called Determining Investor Suitability. So while you're in the library, uh, check out that article, Determining Investor Suitability, and that'll give you kind of a roadmap on how you should be um, developing these relationships and documenting them so that you've got a defense if somebody ever challenges the fact that you didn't have a substantive relationship. Um, the other thing is if you want to email me directly, uh, feel free and I will give you the investor relations blueprint. So my email is kim at syndicationattorneys.com. 
Awesome. So I will throw in another vouch there saying go to syndicationattorneys.com. There's a ton of resources there. If you're new or even if you're experienced, go do yourself a favor, professional develop yourself and go read a bunch of those articles because you're going to learn a lot. Um, And then also make sure that you're picking up Kim's book, How to Legally Raise Private Money. Now, before we let you guys go, before you get out of the car and go into work, do us a favor, go and drop a review, go over to iTunes, Google, wherever you're listening to this and just drop a five-star re- re- review. It lets Dan know that he did a good job and I'm he really needs that insecure. pat on the back. He's he that. got a baby yeah. coming tomorrow, people. So by the time this goes live, he's going to have a baby in his arms. You want his daughter to see him with a three-star review? No, you want him to see a five-star podcast. review. Yeah. Oh, that might be fun. So <laughs> that's going to do it for us, guys. We appreciate you and we'll see you next week.